Follow then in your reading from your portion of the Word of God, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor should be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now, we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Let us pray and seek God's blessing. Our gracious God, we thank you for this portion of your word. Uh, we believe it to be inspired. It is your word. And Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God might so bless your word today that in a specific way, it will come to our hearts as your word to us, corporately as a church, individually as individuals. We love to hear your word. We thank you for your word. And we pray that you will use it today to accomplish your purpose in each of our hearts and lives. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul had a pastor's heart. He established churches. He over, was overseeing these churches. And he had a pastor's compassion, concern, love, and even a pastor's rejoicing. And we see this very clearly. As we have studied chapter 3, we see that Paul rejoiced. What did he rejoice in? What brought joy to the pastor's heart of the Apostle Paul? Well, it had to do with what we call the first principle. What was that first principle? Well, I hope you remember. That first principle is simply this. All who are joined to Christ are preserved for his ever lasting kingdom. That's much reason to rejoice as individual believers, as a pastor shepherding a flock, knowing that one day his people will be there on that final day with him in heaven. That brings great rejoicing. But Paul had a concern, just as pastors have concerns. It would be quite interesting sometime if it were possible to share all of the concerns that a pastor might have over any given congregation. Paul was concerned. Now what would bring concern after such great rejoicing? Well, it was the second principle that we studied. What is the second principle? Not all who profess to be in Christ are truly joined to Christ. That's reason for concern. Because there is such thing as a false profession of faith. The stony ground here, sprouting up immediately. Very promising, but very disappointing. Because when the sun of persecution and tribulation arises, 
immediately the plant wilts away and reveals that there is no true life. Well, Paul being a pastor, not only rejoiced, not only had concerns, but true to his duty as a pastor, he exhorts, he gives exhortations. And what was that exhortation? Well, it's based on principle number three. And principle number three says this, the proof of the reality of one's relationship to Christ is continuance in the way of Christ. And his exhortation would be, continue. On and on, day after day, week after week, yes, year after year, continuing in the Word, continuing in living the Christian life. Continuance in the ways of Christ is proof of vital union with Christ. Paul says, if you continue in my word, then he had reason to rejoice. Christ said, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples. Indeed, Christ is telling us the proof of true discipleship is day after day continuing in the word. Well, we sought then, after we established these three principles, we sought to answer a question. What was the question? Well, the question was this. Why are the saints of God kept? Why are those who are truly joined to Christ preserved and why do they persevere in faith? holiness, and obedience. Why does all of this happen? Well, we attributed some of it to God and some of it to the believer. We said they persevere from the perspective of God's work and they persevere from the standpoint of their own activity. From God's standpoint, the saints of God are preserved and persevere because of the covenant of grace, because of the work of the triune God in administrating that covenant. God has committed to a covenant with his people. But from man's standpoint, they persevere because the true believer is thoroughly convinced without any doubt that he must persevere and because he is so convinced, he uses, he seriously implements the means that God has ordained for perseverance, both private means and public means. Personal devotion, personal walking with God, personal obedience to God, corporate worship in the house of God with God's people. Worshiping together, praying together, hearing the word of God preached. Those are some of the means of grace that causes the believer to persevere. Now, today we're going to conclude this section on the perseverance and the preservation of the saints. And what we're going to do is consider the implications. There are many, many implications about the truths that we have been learning. There are theological implications and there are practical implications. And may I just say, you really cannot really separate the two because theological ap uh, applications and implications are very practical. And so it's hard to 
separate them and say these are the theological and these are the practical because they are quite related as we will see. We will seek to make some distinction. It's interesting that I think some people by nature tend to kind of be more theological in their thinking and therefore they're drawn more to the theological implications. Some people are blessed and gifted with a more kind of a practical outlook on issues and uh, so they, they tend to see things more from a pr practical perspective. Well, actually, as I've already alluded, the, the practical is rooted in the theological. Again, we see that they are joined together. The doctrinal, the theological and the doctrinal, if rightly understood, always arrives at a practical application. That's why at the end of our messages, normally we say, now we're going to make some applications. And most of those times, those applications are of a practical nature. How, what are we going to do about the truth that we've just been exposed to? How am I going to walk out of here in a, with a, in a neat little package and a, uh, and a bow? and take it home with me and say, here's what I have to do about this. Here's how I can put it into practice. Well, first of all, what are the results, both theological and practical, if we deny that God keeps his people. You're going to have to follow pretty closely this morning. We have studied the truth that because of God's covenant arrangement, God on his part preserves his people. But what if we were to deny that and to say God doesn't do that? What would be the far-reaching implications of such a thing? Number one, it would be a denial of the immutability of God. Think with me. What we would be saying in essence is this. Although God has purposed in eternity to save a people, and though in time he gave his son, and though in time he effectually called them out of darkness into light, somewhere along the line something happened. So that if anyone whom he has chosen and effectually called is able to fall from grace and be ultimately lost and perish, what do we have? We have a change in the disposition of God towards that redeemed sinner. We're saying that back in eternity past, God purposed to save a people. That was his eternal purpose. And in time, he sent the Son to die. He sent the Holy Spirit to redeem them. He brought them to himself. But if you say that somehow that person can be lost, do you see that is going against the attribute of God's immutability, his unchangeableness? What we would have then, we would have God changing from, an, from a disposition of eternal love now to a disposition of eternal wrath towards that soul. Yet when God speaks to his people in his covenant people in the Old Testament, in Malachi he says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, the sons of Jacob are not consumed. That's a testimony of God's immutability. His unchangeableness. You see, the reason why people are not consumed is that God does not change. 
We read in Romans 11 that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Those who would deny either with their lips or some hidden suspicion of the heart that it is somehow possible for those who have been truly saved to ultimately be lost. They are denying the immutability of God. You are saying that the eternal purpose of God somehow can be frustrated and thwarted by man. Secondly, you would be denying the efficacy of the intercession of Christ. The Lord Jesus now lives in heaven to plead on behalf of all those for whom he died and shed his blood. John 17. Read it. Study it. Learn it. Love it. John 17 is the intercessory prayer that God, Christ is praying for you as a believer right now as you sit here in this service. What a blessing to think of that. Christ is interceding for me. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. <laughs> Hebrews 7, 25 says this, Hence also he is able to say forever, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so if you're saying or thinking, and there are people who do, who say, oh yeah, it's possible to be saved and to be lost. And you have to be saved all over again. And you could be lost. And you might die in a lost condition and ultimately go to hell. We're refuting all of that today by saying, number one, if you believe that, you're going against the immutability of God. If you believe that, that a person can be saved and lost, you're going against the efficacy of the intercession of Christ. You're saying, God doesn't hear his prayers. God, if he does hear the prayers of his son at the right hand, doesn't always answer them. Those are serious charges. Christ is pleading. Christ is making more than verbal requests. In a sense, his presence at the right hand of God, his very presence is a plea that God would be merciful to his redeemed. So, thirdly, the theological implication of denying the preservation of the saints is that we deny the ability of the Holy Spirit to seal and sanctify believers on to the day of redemption. So to take the position that a person can be saved and lost and perish is to go against the immutability of God. It is to go against the intercessory ministry of our Lord and it is to go against the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to seal him unto the day of redemption. You remember that it's part of the description of the new covenant where God said, I will, I will, I will. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. 
and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Can't get any more certain than that. That is God's commitment. Now, we run across this verse. In fact, you can turn there if you like. 1 John 3, 9. 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now follow closely. Yes, yes, he may grievously sin. He may be overcome by some sin at some point. And he may even bring reproach to himself and to the Lord. But there are certain forms of sin to which a true believer cannot abandon himself. He cannot abandon himself to absolute unbelief. He cannot abandon himself to the total dominion of sin and make a peace treaty with sin. He will always be fighting. Why do I say these things cannot be? Because John says his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. There are certain sins that he cannot give himself to. Why? Because the divine seed within him, that principle of new life of the Holy Spirit, will make it impossible for him to utterly abandon himself to sin. Romans 6.14 says, Sin shall not be master over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. That is not a promise. It is a declaration. When anyone or whenever someone has made a glowing profession of Christ, maybe even given some evidence of faith in Christ, and yet we see them give themselves over to a resolute life of unbelief, we have no grounds to believe that God ever did a work of grace, for sin does not lord it over those who have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. These are theological implications. Any theological perspective that denies the immutability of God, that denies the efficacy of the intercession of Christ, and denies the ability of the Holy Spirit to seal that believer, is denying all of these truths that we have just stated for you. Those are the theological implications. What are the practical implications? Well, there are some. There are some practical implications. First practical implication, when you hold to those things that we've just mentioned, you rob the saints of a view of God that is worthy of their worship. You're demeaning God. You're going against his immutability. You're going against Christ's intercession. You're going against the Holy Spirit. What are you doing? You're literally robbing the saints of a God that is worthy of worship. You're saying God is not Im immutable. You're saying the prayers of Christ are not efficient. You're saying the work of the Holy Spirit is inefficient. And is such a God worthy of worship? No. No way. You see, in a world of change, in a world where really nobody can hardly trust anybody else's word these days, 
And let me just enter a parenthesis. I've lived long enough to remember back when a man's word was his word. I see some people shaking their heads, you know what I mean. It wasn't necessary to even have a contract. All you had to do was shake hands and have a man's word. We don't see much of that today. In a world when there's change and, there's, and it's difficult, in a broad sense, for people to trust one another, there's no resting place for confidence. And you tell that world, well, you see, the disposition of God might change at times. Really? You might have to say, though he has loved you with an everlasting love, and though in grace he has called you, yet somehow he might yet damn you. Well, that's not a way to encourage the saints of God. That would not be a gospel that we would want to preach. If I had to proclaim God, whom I... I would be seeking to get a people to worship that God, and yet a God who in a sense would be fickle in his attitude towards his people, that would be an impossibility. So to deny the preservation of the saints is to rob the saints of a view of God worthy of worship, to rob them of a view of Christ that would be worthy of their worship, and the same with the Holy Spirit. But the second practical implication is this. It robs the saints of a view of God worthy of their confidence. After Paul stated this tremendous doctrine, Paul himself draws the practical implications. And it is one of tremendous confidence in the face of mounting opposition. Paul was a realist. Paul moved from the theory of doctrine of preservation and up in the heights of that doctrine. But he also deals with some very weighty theological implications and terms. Paul thinks of the salvation of God's people. He sees that salvation traced back to the eternal foreknowledge of God. He sees God putting his affection upon those people. And then he sees God predetermined that those people should be like his son. And he effectually calls them and he justifies them. And their glorification is so certain that in Romans 8, Paul writes it in the past tense. As if it had already happened. What is all the implications? What would be the implications of this? Paul says... Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all the day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him that loved us. Paul knew what it was to be beaten. Paul knew what it was to be thrown into prison and abandoned. Paul knew what it was to be shipwrecked. Paul knew what it was to be stoned and left for dead. Paul experienced all of that and more. And as Paul looks into the face of opposition, 
What does Paul say? If God be for us, who can be against us? What was the basis of Paul's confidence, unwavering confidence? In the midst of the conflict, it was that God who calls, God who justifies, God who glorifies, nothing could separate him from that. There's true confidence. <coughs> Very practical implications. Deny that he pre preserves his own. You rob the saints of a view of God worthy of worship. And you rob the saints of a God worthy of their total confidence. And in the third place, you rob the saints of a God that's worthy of praise. You know, if you deny that the saints of God are kept because God purposes to keep them in the new covenant, think with me then a saint who has been preserved for 10 years, if he at that point cannot fall at the footstool of sovereign grace and say with the words of the hymn writer, "'Tis grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve. Grace has brought me safe this far, say it with me, and grace will lead me home. Do you see the confidence? Through many a dangerous toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will take me home. You cannot help if not in theory, in practice, to praise God for such a redemption. Why do the saints persevere? Well, we've already seen from God's point, haven't we? And we're seeing it now from man's point. We have considered the first principle that all who are joined to Christ are kept. We've seen what happens if you deny the second principle. And the third principle. What are the second and third principles? I want us to zero in on that for just a minute. The second and third principles. Second principle, not all who profess to be in Christ are truly joined to Christ. Principle number three, and which is the focus of Paul's exhortation, is that the proof of the reality of one's relationship is continuance in the ways of Christ. Multitudes in our day take the position, and they deny that those who are in Christ will persevere and that they will continue in faith and holiness and obedience. And that is an unbiblical doctrine. Most who hold that theory hold to what is popularly known more popularly, and I'm putting it in quotations because it can be misunderstood, but it's this saying, well, once saved, always saved. I would ask the question, what do you mean by saved? What is your biblical concept of salvation? If you're going to tell me that once saved, always saved, 
I want to know more about what you mean about being saved. Some might say, well, if you just make a decision, you would just come to Christ and, and uh, make that decision. Then no matter what happens after that decision, you'll go to heaven. Huh. That's wrong. That's wrong. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that if we're truly saved, we will continue to be saved by God's preserving and by man's persevering. Those two terms have to go together. There's no way of separating them. Well, I think we've seen what it is to deny these wonderful and glorious truths. We can see that there's a denial of God's electing love. There's a denial of the goal of the purchasing love of the Son to redeem us from every lawless deed. We see that these implications are serious and are for reaching. One of the truths that I want us to take home with us today is this. Christ died to have a holy people. Christ died to deliver us out of this present evil world. That is biblical redemption. And I want to make it very clear. Christ will get what he paid for. No doubt. There are pawn shops around town. How do the pawn shops operate? You're needing some cash. So you take your television down there. And the pawn shop owner says, I'll give you $20. But you have to pay me $30 to get it back. That's how it works. So what would you think if you, a guy does that and he goes in there and he pays the $30 and he walks out without his television set? Right. <laughs> Something's wrong. No, you expect him to get what he paid for, right? He put the money down, he takes back his television set. Christ purchased a people for his own. He paid the price of redemption. And it's unthinkable to think Christ would not get what he paid for. What he died for. Well, I want us to think about these things as we close today of God's grace, of God's commitment in his covenant with us, and of Christ's intercession for us, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the fact and the truth should really grip us today that God has brought about eternal salvation of our never dying souls. We can rejoice in that today. Let's do so as we pray. Our gracious God, we have much for which to give you thanks. We're thankful, Lord, for your eternal distinguishing love that you set up on us in eternity past to save a people, to have a people, a holy people. Lord, as your people, we can look back over 
days, weeks, months, and years and see how by your grace you have kept us. And as we mentioned a moment ago, yes, indeed, grace has brought us safe this far. And grace will take us home. Make these truths a reality to us today that we can go from this place with much assurance, much reason to rejoice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.